Good morning, everybody. All right, very glad you're here. Um, didn't expect, to be honest, expected fewer people, given the last day and assignment and everything, so good to have you. Uh, part of the style in which this is meant to be is a bit inspirational, and it is a bit early on the last day of, uh, of school, but hopefully I'll kind of get you all warmed up uh, for it. And um, I suppose what I want to talk about is some combination of purpose, leadership, and fun in life. And with the whole idea that we, kinda, we have a world to reinvent, and I do not believe that we can endure merely through life and do a good job at it. So through this whole lecture, through this whole course, you would have seen that however we slice the cake, we've got a world that has business models, models that are relating to each other, product services, most of them are running out of date and are in desperate need to be reinvented because they're based on assumptions about the world that no longer hold true, whether it's about the limits of the ecosystem or whether it's about the value of human life and what we understand about how people tick and what is possible in the world. Most of what we see around us isn't based on this kind of new contemporary understanding of these things. And as a result, if you ask me, I think feels quite hollow, yeah? And feels quite uncomfortable and we sort of slug our way through it. And so we do have a world to reinvent. And I want to ask you whether you know what your role in that is. You might call it calling. You might call it, what is your work in this world? Kind of, what is your work in reinventing this world? I, um, I've grown quite resentful, I must admit, of how little value the Western society puts on our sense of purpose. In a lot of ancient societies, you got as much as a new name when you figured out what your work was. You became the you know, future seeing eagle or the healing word or whatever it might be. It, be, it was important, yeah, in Aboriginal Australian culture, boys and girls would go, their versions of walk about and again would change identity. It was acknowledged that you might have a role in society, that isn't everything, you're not going to do everything the world needs, but you're going to do a bit and you're crafted uniquely for that bit. And the world waited until you figured out what it was to give you your name and then to start reaffirming you in society so that you can fulfill your purpose, your work, your calling. We don't have that. We pretty much have reduced the value of an individual to what do you do? Yeah, we'll ask that question. What do you do? Architecture, design, product design. And we'll go on to judge pretty much everything about you by what it is that you do. And I hope I'm not telling you anything you don't know. What you do on a daily basis can be way less than what your bigger picture work is actually about. And what I'm also going to um, take us through the next 45, 50 minutes is a hypothesis that we can find our work, we can find our calling. That is the best that I know at a happy life and at a fulfilling career. And to do that, you pretty much need to do one of the most counterintuitive things, I'm going to argue. And that is actually to tap into what already drives you, which is often some sort of pain. Sometimes it's joy, but I don't know that many truly happy people. Most of us have some sort of something inside us that we rebel against, that we want to defy, that triggers us, that presses our buttons, that makes us uncomfortable and most of the time we reject it, deny it, stuff it away and get on with doing what we do, such as architecture or design or whatever it might be. And I'm going to argue that if we let our life's work spring from what is already driving us, that is the most energy we are ever going to have to put towards the work we do. And it is a waste in a world that needs reinvention to not tap into that, however confronting and confusing in a society that undervalues it, it might actually be. So that's the hypothesis. And I'm going to start with something that is a little scary if we're talking of taking risks. I'm actually going to tell you a bit of my story. And it is slightly heavy and it can be confronting and it might make you slightly uncomfortable and if it does I do apologize for that. I'm not going to say it for evoking compassion or admiration or pity or anything like that. I'm just going to try to see if in illustrating how my story has connected with a bigger storyline in the world, thinking that maybe if I do you might see 
can you go on a similar journey and is there, is there a way in that for you to reaffirm your work in the world? So with my story, I pretty much didn't know what happiness was until about the age of 22. Um, everything came easy except um, joy in life. I was pretty much depressed and clinically depressed up until about the age of 22. But if we take it a bit further, um, I nearly died at the age of three of pneumonia. And at that time, to get me to a good hospital, my parents ended up getting me to a hospital that took a lot of kids on their way to orphanages. So I was told by the kids that I'd been given up. That left me stuttering, had all sorts of things. Then. Be, being in Russia through the 90s, not enough food, lining up at 6, um, 6 o'clock in the morning at the age of 5 to use food stamps and all of that. But then also being in a, one of those, uh, many of us have them, um, hyper dysfunctional families. Yes, yeah, so I was born to very unkind and numb to the world father and a mother that after, by the time I came around, had pretty much given up on creativity and joy and those sorts of things. And um, as I kind of lived through all of that uh, and internalized the, the stuff that was going on around me, I started getting all sorts of unexplainable illnesses. Ended up with a back disorder that had me walk around in braces. I've had anxiety disorder, as I mentioned, clinical depression. I've been um, all sorts of unwell. And again, I'm not saying this to sort of evoke any sort of um, kind of reaction about that towards me, but to say that there was a bit of a turning point. And, and by the way, many of your stories, I'm sure, can, can match that. Um, we are not lucky enough to live in a world with a lot of functional, happy, loving people raising wonderful kids. Yeah, most of us make do with, with what we get. And, and so for me, um, I'm grateful for that. It's my story, but also what it has created for me is a sense of defiance, and I basically ended up insisting and living and insisting and standing for the possibility and the plausibility of a much better life than I'd ever experienced. Yeah? My whole life added up to creating a drive in me that's something I've never experienced that I can't even expect or understand or fathom is possible and I'm going to find it. And as a result today, if we fast forward before I go back again, my whole life's work is about tracking opportunities, emerging opportunities in the world, and latching organizations and individuals to them, almost like life rafts, if you're starting to see the parallel, that can start pulling us out of these obsolete business models and a numb, shallow, shallow world that we've got. So what I latched onto in my life was studying. That um, came easy, so I decided to apply to U.S. University from Moscow when I was 14. I left home at 15, started university at 16, and uh, went on to end up with 46 grand a year from Cornell, paying me every year to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. So never believe there's not enough money in the world. There is money for what you want to do if you set your mind on it. I've never had it myself, but it's always come around in, in amounts that were necessary. And so I went on to do that, and then I have been very fortunate. I'm 30. I have worked in Russia, the US, New Zealand, South Africa, America. And today I run my own business. I work with wonderful people. I get to be here. So I, I am actually quite happy now. And I work with tremendous people. I have great friends. And again, not so much, this isn't about me, but it's about saying that I insisted on not settling and I'm about to take you through how this not settling is actually, it just happens to be a huge big storyline in the world. And by me not settling and not buying into that quote, you know, what's the secret to happiness, low expectations? Have you heard that one? It is actually quite dangerous to absorb some of these truisms. We see these quotes and we can kind of go, yeah, that's true. And there's a lot of danger in that. Because even if we in our first world problems actually say, yep, that makes a lot of sense, secret to happiness is low expectations, six billion people in the world would be absolutely devastated to take that honest truth. So that truism 
I've lived to abandon and very much absorb that I will insist and stand for in every day of my life, try to bring forward a future that is much better than anything we've ever experienced. And as Dominique and I talk about, it's the term that irresistible future that has become kind of my, my quest, I suppose. And for all sorts of reasons. And one of them is we do not create symphonies out of hate for bad music. We're not going to create sustainable societies out of disdain for how these work. That is not enough. Victory cannot be traced to fear of defeat. There is that little bit of defiance and insistence and hope that actually allows people to lift off a bit of the everyday reality and actually not mind the sacrifice so much. So that has become my story. And it is a big storyline trying to play out in the world as well. And in addition, to having a pretty sort of fun life. There's two more things about however confronting it is, aligning your life's work with what already drives you. One is if you think of magnets and you're trying to bring a bunch of magnets together, it is going to be actually pull and push and tag and because each magnet has its own kind of energetic field around it. And this uncomfortable pull and pull, push and tag is how I believe most of our lives are. Because our work is distinct to our value system, at least to some extent, is distinct to how we might build relationships, is yet something else to our, to our hobbies. That is exhausting. So part of the benefit of connecting into our gut in terms of what drives us, I believe, is to actually have a chance at a much less effortful life, so a chance at an effortless life. And I believe that I am one of the very few people at the moment that is fortunate. My whole life is aligned. My work, my friends, my hobbies, what I travel for, where I travel. And I don't worry about having a corporate persona and a something else persona and a Facebook profile and all of that being somehow different and trying to keep up with the various people I've created out there in the world. Yeah. And it is much easier. So that's another um, potential advantage. And another one is kind of being your own social experiment. Because I believe that the greatest resource that you have is your story. And so as you live through it, you will grow in empathy and compassion and understanding for what the people who are going to connect into your story go through. So I've become my own social experiment. So in not settling, I take risks. I observe how I feel stress. When I give up full employment in the middle of GSC, going, OK, I'm going to try this. If I'm, gonna, if I'm asking companies to take risks and, and leaps of faith, how is that going to feel? Can I sleep? <laughs> Can I eat? Yeah. This weekend, I give up my apartment, and I'm not getting a new one. I'm actually going homeless for a few months to try to live, because I have um, some potential work with the UN, and there is some potential work to come back to in the US. There is Russia, there is work here. I'm actually going to try being homeless. I think in our world with service departments and all sorts of things and friends, that is just possible. But I'm experimenting. I'm constantly experimenting on, if I don't just settle into the life I've got, how does that feel like? And I've got to say, it's confronting, but it's tremendous amounts of fun. So I'll be homeless for about six months. So well, I'm going to ask you, and you absolutely don't have to, and I'm no psychologist or no qualified person to do this, or I'm no elder in a Native American culture, but I'm going to ask you to have a think of what your work might be if you don't know yet. And I'm going to show you in a minute a bit of an animation around opportunities that I believe exist in the world. So connecting to some of the words I've used, these are these storylines that want to be told. Yeah, they want to get out. They want to get on paper. They want to be talked about. They want to be manifested. So I'll show you one way to look at what those are. And I wonder if you might be able, maybe not this morning, <laughs> being tired and all, but to explore, is there something that drives you, that controls you, that, that is bigger than your cerebral brain, that actually resonates with some of that? And then hopefully, as you go on and figure out what your contribution to sustainability and regenerative design is, 
feeding that story and seeing if it can fuel a bit, a bit of your work. So, how do we leapfrog towards this living future? What opportunities exist? And also, um, what are the rules of the game? So I started with saying so many of the assumptions that predicate, that underpin our business models or models of relating are obsolete. So first up, I'm going to actually have us look at what I believe is the new set of assumptions, the rules of the game, the contours of the playing field, whatever the analogy suits. Because if we understand them, we can understand what success might look like and what the winning strategies might be. So the first new rule of the game, assumption, I've called gluttony. And it refers to the complete insatiability that we now have as people towards everything. Information, food, <laughs> um, straightforwardly, but information, experience, wanting more, faster, better, and not having any kind of natural stop in us, it seems. And that, as you might imagine, deals with anything from the increasing footprint of individuals as well as countries to always needing more data. Yeah? So we keep buying bigger computers thinking, oh, we now have more space, but that just makes us save more stuff. Just use more data, use more speed. The next one I've called on credit. And it's this idea of externalities that seems to be so embedded in the DNA of how we live today. It's this idea that I do what I want to do here and now, something else, somewhere else at another time deals with it. And obviously credit cards and buying on credit is one example of that. Yeah, living not by your means, but as you might imagine, environmentally, socially. Socially, I cannot have a non-guilty life today. Almost any decision I make through my day is going to disadvantage or take or abuse somebody in the world somehow. And right now, I can't break that, short of not leaving, leaving my apartment, yeah? So that idea that somebody socially, environmentally, economically is taking care of the consequences of decisions we make is very key to how society seems to operate. Future light refers to a documented anxiety that most people have about the future. We don't have good stories about what the future holds. We actually don't have, if we speak of narratives and stories, and as you might imagine, that's actually one that I am tapping into with my own life, but not having an awful lot to go on. The next one I've called Gods Are Us. And it is intended to refer to this phenomenon that if you imagine kind of a bunch of kids playing and hurting each other and you know, messing with the sandbox that they're in, thinking, surely if we get a bit too out of line, an adult will come in and just stop it. So we're fine, yeah? And then we kind of go, oops, we're it. There is no other clever, wise anybody who's going to walk in and go, no, no. And there is actually another angle to it. A couple of decades ago, scientists have concluded that we're actually living in Anthropocene as an era. So we had Stone Age, Ice Age. Ages are named after the most important, significant change agent at that time. Ice, Dark Ages, etc. Yeah, We are officially in Anthropocene, meaning that the human is, in fact, indeed, the most powerful agent of change in the world. And we're not quite fessing up to it. And I believe that even if society is starting to fess up to it on the downside, yes, we have the power to cause climate change, disrupt food chains, completely obliterate hope from millions of people, there is an upside to it as well. We can actually do something about it. And that's why I strongly disagree with the despair that sets in. What's, that's actually one of the reasons I've started disassociating many years ago with the sustainability movement, because it, it's kind of defeatist. And I'm like, wait, you can't have your cake and eat it too. If we're this powerful to mess up all this stuff, surely if we got our act together, we can also restore it. The next one I've called concurrence, and it refers to the simultaneous occurrence of everything. 
Think about fashion. Everything is in. We were saying how we're all representing different decades. This is perfect because we've got Pippa, you're kind of, what, what, what year are you today? Go, go, go. 60s. Go, 60s? You're a bit 50s and apparently a bit 70s. Yeah. <laughs> But it's, it's that thing in, in fashion, flares are in, but so are Lady Gaga's maid dresses, yeah? And everything in between, and you can't go wrong, yeah? And same with food, same with information. Take worldviews, views on relationships. I have friends who are polygamous gay, consensually, and I have friends who are holding out for marriage and a wedding ring and a wedding dress and ever after and white picket fence. And they know each other. And they're totally fine. It's like all of the models of relationships, life, work, love, are coexisting at the same time. I don't even know how, like, we almost need little assessment criteria for which world we're in. Because you do not underestimate the difference in the universes that we all simultaneously bring into the room. But it's also driving us bunkers because I'm no longer um, a daughter only when the time difference allows me to call home to Moscow and then for eight hours a day a, a, a worker and then for a couple hours a day a, an athlete and then a friend. Everything goes on at the same time. You're a mother and a daughter and a father and a child all at the same time. And so we're actually seeing what might be called identity schizophrenia to some extent because we are getting confused and exhausted by juggling so many hats, especially if they do not align with each other. The next one I've called nomading. And this refers to everything being on the move, from information via the broadband and whatnot, to disease, disease migration. Malaria, uh, malaria belts are shifting. We have all sorts of invasive species. To be honest, whenever we start talking about restoring, you almost start questioning which state are we restoring to, because things are so, so much in flux. But also people, yeah? So what I've described to you, I am a representative of the nomadic population. Yeah, there is a bunch of people like me. Some of you are here that are studying abroad. I don't know if this is an exception or rule to your life. But I've got a couple of citizenships and I have basically, am, as I mentioned, I'm actually not gonna live anywhere for a little while. That is no longer such an exception, yeah? But what that is doing, if we talk about corporates, if we talk about organizations, that is shifting our understanding of what is called corporate memory. Gen Y are planning on staying less than two years with any one employer, moving. So we, are, we need to figure out, well, how do we capture wisdom? How do we capture insight? We cannot stop this right now, I believe. All of this list that I'm showing, one of the criteria that I've used to put these things on this list is that they're out of control now. They might change later, but for now, they've got a life of their own, and this is one of them. Used by yesterday is kind of very much what this course has been about. It's about obsolescence, it's about tipping points. And as I mentioned early on, very much nearly anything from how we make these chairs to whether we even need data projectors to do we even rock up to a classroom to hear a lecture. We can basically question anything around us and the answer, it depends, yeah? Command and control I use to describe a shift in what power looks like, what power is about. For most of the last couple of centuries, we have had a very yang uh, or yen form of power. Power was hierarchical, it looked white, probably middle age and male and aggregated in boardrooms or countries and the developed world was dominating over the developing world. And all of these assumptions about what power and influence looks like are changing. And it's not as simple as gender and it is not as simple as color, even though those things are most definitely coming into effect. I was working with a Maya family company which basically manages wealth for most of the high net worth individuals around Australia telling them, me, standing in front of these guys worth millions and millions of dollars, they paid me to basically say to them, your boardroom cannot look like this for much longer. If you are to have credibility with the humanitarian space, with your own children, you have to start taking that into account. But also if I go back to the yin and yin, 
this is not gender. This is almost, if you, if you like, style or, or energy or approach to doing things. So if the yen way is more um, hierarchical and control, and to be honest, if I have a broken leg, I do want somebody to just make a decision about it and fix it, yeah? This is not a wrong way to be. But the yin way is collaborative, restorative nurturing. Social networking is a yin thing. Visa is one of the largest organizations on earth, completely decentralized. Departments of defense are decentralizing. Wikipedia, crowdsourcing. We're having a tremendous surge of very yin approaches to life that are allowing us to um, tackle the world's issues in a non-hierarchical, collaborative, open source way. Connections is a platform out of one of the US universities that is actually putting in open source teaching material so that you can co-create textbooks and print textbooks in that, in that fashion freaky because that means, oh, but my name isn't going to go on this textbook I've been writing for 15 years. It's like, by the time you're done, it's out of date. So we're actually in a place, yeah, we're letting go of a bit of control for the sake of um, being relevant is a possibility. Permeability. The next new assumption. On the one end, this refers to the end of privacy. Your whole life is on record, and people who go after us, we, we don't actually understand yet, I believe, the implications of this digital tattoo that we're getting, that in 15 years I might want to run for government, but my whole life and everything I've ever done, and whether I dance drunk on tables or screamed at my boss, is going to be somewhere on the internet, accessible for anybody to go, yep, this is the sort of person there whether we are or not, yeah? But it's something that I think we're actually grappling with, the end of privacy, complete runaway accessibility of people to information, to disease, to each other. Again, brilliant, because I can, with my handheld device, I can vote in Russia, I can access information, I can crowd, help crowdsource a solution to cancer, but at the same time, I can't hide, I can't run, and I can't start over, yeah? So that's permeability. So what opportunities does this create? This is what I'm hoping that as I go through the next lot over the next 10 minutes or so, it might start showing you, do you have a bit of your story of that thing that you can't be indifferent towards? Does it echo some of the bigger ones in the world? Because that's how I believe you can have the most rewarding and productive life. So the first opportunity that is created by our increasing footprint, socially and environmentally, externalizing con consequences, realizing that we are the most powerful, is an opportunity to actually restore control. Whether it's from starting to live by our means to on a human level, allowing us to actually restore control, open plan offices, like I'm designing a change program for Fairfax Media. And as an organization, I'm helping them be all right with being frustrated with open plan offices because introverts find it tremendously difficult to be productive in it. In a lot of ways, in seeking opportunities, we've completely gone to this American happy-go-lucky smile all the time model of of life, and this is actually alienating a tremendous amount of people and making them unproductive. If you're an introvert, um, look at the TED talk on the power of introverts. Introverts are back in. So um, there you go. <laughs> so restoring control on the environmental, political, or social level is a tremendous opportunity. And if we look at how the power is shifting, but also with the nomading, we know that almost any political or economic system is failing its citizens. We don't have to look very far because we have this access to information. We have people traveling. All of you are from, I don't know, 20 different countries? So that is, that is feeding this next opportunity and also the exploration of all these future models. And that is an opportunity to create positive futures. This is the one that I'm tapping into. And it's about actually redefining what a good life is. Again, when I was working with these wealthy, wealthy people, I challenged them to help us redefine what wealthy means. 
because it's, it's starting to sound a bit dirty, like we're a bit confused. Wealth isn't bad, but they need to write new stories around what the, what the value of it is. Patriotism. I would argue that with the US activities over the last little while, most of us are wondering whether patriotism is such a good idea. And we definitely know that communism, socialism, or capitalism aren't going to get us a tremendous future. So an opportunity to actually do a bit of remithing and to create new stories about what it is to be human in the world, what success looks like, what is good architecture, what, what, what are architects, what is your role in society, what is the role of designer, what is collaboration. Any of those things really need new stories that would be compelling, that would tap into how we want to live and resonate and create symphonies and victories and motivate people, not out of guilt or obligation. That's been my other big pet peeve with the whole sustainability story. We've basically already, anybody driven by obligation or duty, we already have on board. But anybody driven by ambition and something else just looks at that and goes, all right, so you're telling me that I need to live a life of self-deprivation, self-deprecation, and in fact, if I just kill myself, that's probably the best thing I want to do for the world, is a set of reactions that a lot of people have with sustainability. Because in telling us everything we've got wrong, we haven't replaced it with what success looks like. We haven't created narratives, compelling narratives of these irresistible futures that people can try on and go, yeah, that, I want to create that one. And it doesn't have to be homogenous. Because if you look at any ecosystem, there's so many of them. It doesn't have to be, oh, everybody's now going to do permaculture and live on the land and not shave their armpits. That's not for everybody. But neither is the life I lead. And neither is anything in between. But we can create such tremendous new opportunities. And we need to start challenging our assumptions about how we talk about sustainability. Because, for example, the whole you can't fly, that's the worst thing for the environment. I will not accept, personally, any definition of sustainability that tells me that because that means I can never see my family. That is not an option. Get better fuels. Sort it out. We can sort it out. We do not need to constantly deprive ourselves of things that potentially are actually nurturing and critical for how we live in the world. The next opportunity field is created by another set of trends, and it's actually an opportunity for compassion to have mercy. This is hard. People are exhausted. People are run down. The sustainability movement has a tremendous rate of burnout alone because we work too hard and we don't really have proper support. And corporations can use a bit of compassion also because legally they're not allowed to do anything that does not generate profit. So unless we start changing the, the, the regulation, we need to have a bit of mercy on them as well. And, f and work with kind of what they've got. And so opportunities here are actually to restore dignity. And you can do that through design. You know a lot of examples of how design has changed the world. I've already talked to you at the markets about how much architecture played a role in apartheid and also in Soviet Russia in building alienation, judgment, ridicule into the very fabric of society. By the same token, the example that you see here is swags for the homeless, and that's a design, sorry, and that's a design piece that has actually won UN awards. The challenge, have you heard of swags for homeless? Yeah? So the challenge was let's create a sleeping bag for homeless people so that the rates of hypo hypothermia um, drop. But they unleash the best of design at it. And as a result, I see people in Melbourne, people like us, non-homeless non people, carry them around because they're cool. And that's a part of when I've also talked to you about Apple and good design. Smartphones have probably changed the face of political participation forever. It didn't necessarily do it for that. But these are cool, beautiful objects that you want to hold on to. And then it just so happens that you can vote with a touch of a, touch of a screen. So part of me thinks, if we've got a water issue, what would Apple do? Yeah. Like, what, what does that power of design and not settling for second best, what would that make available through design to issues of dignity and food security and social participation and empowerment and, and inequity? Not second best. What would the best make available to us? The next opportunity here is I've called Unplug Me. 
And it's this thing because we're always in, it's exhausting. I feel like my life sometimes is a Frankenstein. I've built it, but I want it to stop sometimes, yeah? Because it starts chasing you and all these opportunities you've created and you just want to go, ah. So there is a tremendous opportunity to help people unplug and guess what? Biomimicry is an awfully big part of that. Different pace, different response of the immune system. Just whew, exhale, pause for a minute creating places of respite, experiences of respite for people is going to be very valuable in the next decade or so, I'm convinced. And another one I've called Bring Back the Memories. It's actually feeding nostalgia. We have studies showing that people miss the 70s who've never been in the 70s. We have these ideas that things were better and, and truer and somehow more comfortable and manageable. And I actually believe that the mega brands feed off that. Because when you see Ikea, or when you see McDonald's in the middle of nowhere, you, you feel happy because you know what to expect. It's familiar. And so these mega brands, I believe, are feeding off that. Can we do a similar thing? Human experience is tremendously a shareable thing. We can have a lot of connection points around human experience. And can we just make this world a little bit less new all the time? by tapping into nostalgia through design, through patterns, through language, that actually bring a bit of compassion and a bit, bring a bit of familiarity to us as we cope with this increasing pace. The next opportunity field is, again, created by permeability, by this constant going on of everything at the same time, and by our power. And that is very much an opportunity to reinvent. Reinvent business models, relations models, Things don't have to be the same. Don't fix what's not broken, but I think challenging and thinking, is there a different way? Is there a simpler way, rather than just patching up obsolete, run out of date models, actually creating new ones? And I believe we need to start with us. Have you heard of the um, reptilian versus mammalian versus cerebral brain? Cerebral is the newest. This is the, your analytical, this is your neocortex. And it's actually very new compared to everything else, like baby brain. And this is the one responsible for rational thought. Your mammalian brain is responsible for the emotional life. So this is the one that makes you smile when you walk into a new group of people so that you can diffuse tension. It's the one that helps us connect and build rapport and, and that sort of thing. And then there's another one, and that's your reptilian brain. And this is the one that pretty much is responsible for the fight or flight syndrome. The fight or flight syndrome is activated within one fifth of a second. One fifth. By real or perceived threats to your status, your security, your ability to survive, basically. And of course, if you're being chased by a tiger, that is plenty of time because you've just got to get going. Or if it's a little bit less than a tiger, you punch them out. Yeah, whack them over the head. It was a very relevant type of brain messaging to have a couple of million years ago. Today, it's a little bit of my hypothesis, the way that I'm about to connect these dots, but I'm going to first tell you another piece of fact. So this was a piece of fact, and another piece of fact is that they have confirmed that we experience memories just as strong as real experiences. If you think of a stressful situation, your body does all the same stuff, the heart rate, the the, the sweaty, sweaty hands, all of that is the same. So the way that I've connected these dots is that we perceive danger probably just as strong today as we did back then, and yet almost nothing in our lives is life-threatening. And we are punching each other in the face and running away in our own ways, like absenteeism or withdrawal, apathy, is our contemporary way of flight, yeah? or fight. I'm just going to send this email and copy everybody because I'm angry. Yeah? And yet I think that as we start seeing 25-year-old surgeons and our brain's going to say, this is not possible. They're going to kill me. We're going to need to challenge that because we are learning how to, how to get better and how to teach people potentially faster. By the same token, you're going to see a 65-year-old person who's restarted their life three times over. They're in their third profession. 
and if you see them, they're no, no better doctor because they're actually an intern. And your brain's going to say, I trust this person and not that person. It's brain. It's the brain that's tr trying to keep you alive. Almost nothing in our lives is life-threatening. And another opportunity here is completely new business models. And the blue economy, if you haven't come across that term, um, is definitely worth having a look at. This is almost that new repackaging of sustainability, the rebranding of sustainability. That basically says a lot of what Dominique has been um, kind of telling us, that if waste is somebody else's food, why have less waste? I have never fathomed saying, let's have less grass because it decays. Yeah? So if we actually recreate the models and our buildings in a way that is living, we don't have to have less of stuff. We can have more of stuff so that more other stuff can feed off it. And we can start create paradigms of abundance. We can start create business models and organizational models that aren't based on risk management, that can do better than that. 3D printing is revolutionizing a lot of things. If we actually go to the post office to print our new chair or book, we don't need logistics and trucks and emissions from trucks. We don't always need to keep solving an old issue. We can create new models that are based on, and that's, by the way, a blood vessel printed by German scientists. And BHP Billiton, a very challenging thing, I would imagine, for a lot of you, because money is considered dirty if you're interested in sustainability. But if you look at BHP Billiton and Mozambique, they have reduced malaria cases from over 80% of population to about 8 this is better numbers that government or any NGO organization has been able to demonstrate. And BHP has not done that out of a Good Samaritan for the most part. They are there for a long term, for several decades. They want a viable workforce. They want people to be able to work in their minds. But it, can we challenge ourselves that if the private sector is achieving better outcomes, maybe they might be the better vehicle than some of the other sectors at delivering some of the social outcomes? A big challenging thing, I've been working on a documentary <coughs> with the US and Ireland on some of this. We'll keep you posted. The next opportunity field is to decipher complexity in all of this. Yeah, it's a lot. We're overwhelmed. And one of the opportunity here is to actually become a friendly curator. Universities are becoming that. I believe the Living Future Institute is that. Rather than telling people what to do or think, bringing people around the table facilitating, curating, allowing us to make our own meaning. As practicing designers, you do that quite a bit. And the next one here is thoughtless action. Apparently, we can act our ways into new ways of thinking easier than think our way into new way of acting. Get people to do something. We will post-rationalize whatever it is. Light bulbs replacement was one of those. Just let people put new light bulbs in. They will then go, yeah, we're this sort of people. We're environmental sort of kind. Yeah, we will post-rationalize. And the big thing about design here, this is one of the living building, um, living building challenge schools. If we get kids, if we get people engaging with this new form of architecture, they will not settle for less. They don't necessarily need to be explained by mimicry and, and the rest of it, yeah? And another huge opportunity here is what's called gamification. It's actually bringing play back. We are animals, and we play to diffuse tension, to learn things. Animals play fight, yes? We have so much new stuff to learn in our lives, new ways of using technology and relating to each other, all of this that we're talking about. I believe creating and enabling a playful environment for it is very important. It is much easier to learn that way than being all sophisticated all the time. The second to last opportunity I've called Time Me Not, and this is an opportunity to provide people with a bit of a weightless, light living. And it's driven by technology, it's driven by the fact that we can. And the spe specific thing I've, here I've called snackables. Again, I'm working a lot in uh, workplace design at the moment. And that idea that in an office, rather than having a desk, you have a dozen of work settings from little cubbies to kitchen, uh, kitchen counter looking things to desks with double screens, et cetera, et cetera. 
so that it's like finger food. You match your work setting to what you need to get done. You don't have to commit to main meal all the time. So providing these kind of snackable experience, experiences, but also making things super easy. Like Foursquare as a social network tells you if the Apple Pile emoji you like is on sale next door. It tells you that somebody you know is 200 meters away. Some of this technology can make it really easy to re retain a personal, not a digital, life. So we can draw some lessons from that. And to provide service, not stuff. We talked about products of consumption and products of service. And car share is a great example of that. If I just want to go from A to B, why do I need to own stuff? I'm looking forward to when I contract Origin Energy not to give me kilojoules. I don't even know what that means. Why can't they just condition my house between 18 and 23 degrees? And they can sort out what that means. Yeah, Service, not stuff. And really pushing that forward is a tremendous opportunity. And the last one here is an opportunity to engage. 70% of the workforce in the developed world is disengaged. A waste, a tremendous waste of human potential. And that's to creating pull, not push. Yeah, enticing is working for people. And I'm not going to give too many more examples, but also providing an opportunity to engage directly. When this, uh, when this uh, what are they called? Ne Nespresso? When they invented their own coffee machine, they revolutionized a bit of the retail industry because they took the entire supply chain out of the question and went directly to the customer. That was big. Like for people like me, it's like, wow. And we can do that with crowdsourcing. This is Cancer Commons, creating solutions for cancer by directly bringing together the industry, the scientists, the students. No middleman, no veto, no hierarchy directly engaging on the front line with things that matter to us. So how do we leverage these opportunities to lead? I suppose wrapping up, but look, just hopefully somewhere in there, there was something you might have resonated with. And, and I seriously think the, the most significant definition of leadership I ever heard for me was that leadership is about taking people where they want to go if that makes sense. Because then they want to follow. And you're not a leader if you don't have followers. So this is where the world wants to go in some ways. And the greatest resource that we have is your story. And it's confronting to not push it aside, it to not live in our cerebral, cerebral brain. But I'm challenging you that that is a waste if you don't tap into it. It's a waste if you don't let it own you, control you to some extent, but also drive you, make you productive, make you clear-headed. And if we do have a world to reinvent, we can't afford you to just endure. And the best vehicle I believe we have to reinvent the world is with our stories.